information, we feel the county council should return licensed child care centers to Comar standards, both in terms of license capacity and student to teacher ratios. Mr. Worley, your time is up. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Howard Greif. Mr. Greif, you may begin. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of EO 122.20 on behalf of Lake Hollowell HOA and Greater Only Civic Association. This ongoing pandemic has been physically and mentally impactful on county residents. We all strive and yearn to return to a level of normalcy and we find that endeavor to find balance between safety and practicality. As a civic volunteer serving both association delegate and HOA board member, I've been struggling with that balance. On one hand, HOA and CA volunteers need to fully represent their constituents. On the other hand, need to ensure we are not putting association members at physical or fiscal legal risk. Unfortunately, due to the language drafted in previous versions of the EO regarding section 3A as related to HOA facilities, we've had to make very tough decisions to accurately represent this risk as one example, closing our playgrounds and common use facilities. However, the most recent version has updated language that excludes this fiscally and operationally impossible task of cleaning playground community. This new language will allow associations to open up again without the very legal risk of negligence by not being able to comply with the said executive order. At the same time, it will allow families with children who wish to utilize these facilities to do so while knowing the risks of COVID-19 and having noticed that these playgrounds are not clean for CDC guidelines. We support the updated language regarding private playgrounds, such as HOACA managed, and believe this updated language will greatly benefit the mental health of the children of this county. Our only recommendation at this time is to consider amending the language as such is to be a little more transparent by changing, indicating that the site is not cleaned on an hourly basis to indicating that the site is not being cleaned. Lastly, this is a brave new world we're living in and we're all learning to balance safety versus risk. No two people seem to think alike. And associations need the flexibility to re represent their constituents. While there is no way to guarantee safety, associations need to be able to operate without fear of violation of negligence and at the same time, allow residents who wish to abide by county and state best practices, the ability to do just that and utilize facilities if they choose to, and at the same time, represent homeowners who are not willing to take such risk and ensure that legal action cannot be taken against their member association that they're members of. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you to all members of the County Council, Executive's Office, and key county personnel doing their best to ensure safety of citizens of this county, such as County Executive Mark Elrich, Dr. Travis Gales, and Dr. Earl Stoddard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Luke Cowart. Mr. Cowart, you may begin. Mr. Cowart, are you there, Luke? Okay, perhaps we'll move on to Sean Rose. Mr. Rose, you may begin. Hello, my name is Sean Rose. I am the president of Rock Spring Children's Center. We're a nonprofit um, infant until uh, uh, now we have school age kids. Um, we're licensed for about 200 uh, uh, kids. We've been trying our best during this um, crisis to make sure we operate as safely and as um, effectively as possible. Um, like some of my colleagues had, had testified, um, this is something we take very seriously. I'm not here to, to rail against the restrictions or the regulations. I think they're, in fact, necessary um, to make sure that we're all operating safely. Um, but I do think that there are some changes that need to be made. Um, first is with the data. We need to be seeing the data being released on a daily or weekly basis of the number of kids who are having COVID cases broken down by specific ages. Because right now it seems like we're using a zero to 19 age cohort, and that's not very effective to give us good information as to what's happening. Um, it also should, should include settings so that we know how many cases in childcare settings we're seeing, um, and then can evaluate based on that. Because if things get bad, we're seeing that the data is very good on childcare, that our, our things are working with what we're doing. But if it starts changing and it's not working, we want to know that. We want to know that quickly and we want to make the changes we need to make. Um, the second thing is, is that child care is an essential service. It is something that really we should be working as hard as we can to make sure it's operating as well as it can operate. 
Um, and I don't think that we're, we're quite doing that in the county. Um, our normal regulatory agency is MSDE, and we were having uh, at one point even weekly meetings with them to talk about the protocols and what we're doing and what we're seeing. And then they were making adjustments to our restrictions based on the data, based on these conversations. Um, but then the county steps in and kind of inserts its own spin on it, and it's not based on these conversations. And it makes us feel like, you know, we're not being treated as essential, we're not being supported through this. Instead, we're, we're kind of being treated as disposable, that, you know, we could take it or leave it, you, you know, that you guys can just go down to 50% if we say. You, it, it's, it's not based on what we're actually seeing in the science, and it's not based on what actually we're seeing on the ground. Mr. So, I apologize, your time is up. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Tracy Rana. Ms. Rana, you may begin. Thank you. I own and operate the Goddard School in Olney, and I'm urging the council to return to Comar license group sizes for three and four year old children. To be clear, we all want to operate safely and not put anyone at unnecessary risk. Fortunately, our school has not had any positive cases and we have thoughtfully implemented numerous health and safety precautions. The current order will have three major implications on child care centers that I wanted to bring to your attention. First, we may be forced to ask families to withdraw. Per MSDE Comar teacher to child ratios of one to 10 go into effect November 30th, regardless of the county's limited group size of 15. If centers currently have 14 students and one teacher by November 30th, we will have to add a second teacher. This brings the group size to 16, forcing us to ask a family per class to withdraw. How do we decide? Do we ask a parent who is a nurse or the MCPS teacher who conducts virtual learning at home? Second, the current order prolongs the poor financial health of child care centers. Preschools are operating at losses and are lucky to break even. As a small business that has been struggling for the past eight months, adding staff with no way to offset those costs could be devastating. And thirdly, providing quality child care to families with pro and providing jobs to Montgomery County residents is at risk. Sadly, losing quality child care for families in our community who need to work is at risk. It is the loss of jobs for teachers and staff we employ. Furthermore, it is a loss of business to lo the local landscaping company. We hire the cleaning company, the electrician, the plumber, the list goes on. Our small business contributes in so many ways to the economic health of Montgomery County. In the alternative, we ask that if Montgomery County maintains a group size of 15, that teacher to child ratios remain at the relaxed one to 14 ratio. Because there's no provision for this, we seek your assistance in working with MSDE to keep this ratio relaxed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Stacy Sloan. Ms. Sloan, you may begin. Hi, uh, my name is Stacy Sloan. I'm representing the White Oak Duck in Bowling Alley. We'd like to thank you uh, for allowing us to reach out to share our thoughts on the new executive order. I apologize for speaking fast, but I have a lot of points that I want to get to. We, have, we are committed to the safety of our patrons, and we would like to continue to operate at 20% capacity or 50 people, which is what we are currently at. It allows for a square footage standpoint by more than double the square foot per person than any restaurant by our rough calculation. Additionally, there have been no zero cases traced back to us. Unlike patrons of bars, we have a more mature customer base that is aware and responsible of the virus. We have sent written testimony about what we are doing in order to keep our patrons safe. Unlike the larger businesses around, such as department stores and grocery stores, we are fully compliant with the state mask mandate when we know they are not. It is the point where our patrons sometimes get mad at us for reminding them. Unlike fitness centers, bowling is not a cardiovascular activity, so there is not a significant expulsion of particles, which is no different than going to the grocery store. People are not breathing heavily into their masks. We don't want to be singled out and we want to be treated like fitness centers and restaurants like we have always said along. We bought the bowling alley back in 2018 and wanted to carry on this small business. As a member of the small business community in Montgomery County, we are continuing to go above and beyond by operating our business that is safe and respectfully understand the thoughts of the county and are doing in excess of other businesses in order to keep the lights on. As the last duck pin bowling alley in Montgomery County and only three duck bowling alleys in the county, any additional restrictions will cripple our chance of survival. We ask that you please vote against the executive order or amend it so that we can maintain our current capacity. In addition, it allows 
for it allows small businesses to at least have a fighting chance to compete with the major chains who are allowed to be open and are not as limited as we are. We know and agree with the original reason for the shutting down in order to stop hospitalization hospitals from being overrun. Please also remember that there are no cases that have been traced back to us. I have so many more examples and thoughts that I have previously conveyed to Mr. Hucker, but I'm out of time. So thank you so much for your time and please consider all of our testimonies today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Matthew Liber. Mr. Liber, you may begin. Uh, President Katz, members of the council, thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Matt Liver. I'm the executive director of the Round Soccer Plex, and I also am representing the sports community as a whole. Uh, I'm sure you're all tired of my emails and me appearing on these calls, but I'm back again. Um, I want to address some of the changes to the sports uh, regulations and uh, what I feel is an arbitrary move from 50 down to 25. Moving to 25 basically cripples most outdoor sports since the number of people on the field, coaches and referees, exceeds that number already without an accounting for substitutes. Uh, we've operated for months and we've done so safely. Um, there's been no incidents of within team transmission at the Soccerplex or any other lo sports location I'm aware of. Nationally, there's been studies that say high risk or sports are not high risk for transmission. Um, it, the data just isn't there to support this type of change. Um, I also want to point out some discrepancy between indoor and outdoor. Under these current rules, the field house of the Soccerplex, which is 48,000 square feet, under these rules could have 240 people inside the building for indoor events but we can only have 25 people outdoor. That just seems very strange to me that we would allow so much more indoor and not outdoor. Um, I'm asking you guys to vote against this and ask for changes that make sense. We have asked multiple times to be at the table to discuss these types of changes before they come out, and we've never been included in those conversations. And previous statements from the health commissioner and the director of emergency management said they weren't planning on blanket rollbacks, which this amendment does, uh, and would target those industries that were the problem. Sports are not the problem, yet we're still being targeted. Um, so I, I, again, ask you to vote against this and ask for modifications and, and get the sports community involved when we make those modifications. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back to Mr. Cowart now. Luke Cowart, are you there on the line? I don't believe so. Mr. President, that wraps up our speakers for this public hearing. Thank you very much. And we are going to close the public hearing, but I, I, I think it should be noted that we're closing the oral part of the public hearing. You are, everyone is still encouraged uh, to, uh, and welcome to submit testimony online uh, to continue. Um, the, um, if you couldn't testify today or thought of something else in addition to what you did testify on or whatever, please submit the additional testimony online. Uh, I think we are, we are tentatively, I'm underlining the word tentatively here, but tentatively scheduled to vote on this matter at our meeting next Tuesday, which is November 10th. So that is when we are tentatively scheduled to vote on this. And um, with that, I, I do think that we it should be noted and, and uh, if, if uh, I always say it's when I'm wrong, it's not if I'm wrong, but Mr. Drummer is on the call as well. I think it should be noted the council's role in an executive order. We have, uh, Mr. Drummer, did you want to explain the council's role rather than me uh, explain it? I do it either way. Uh, I did want to mention at some point you should introduce both resolutions, even if you're not going to vote on them. We, we are uh, doing that. Yeah, we will and, do that. And the, uh, well, all right, the council's role is to simply say yes or no to the executive order. Uh, if the council wants changes, it can say no and send it back and the executive can come back with a new order, but you can't actually amend the order and then approve it the way, uh, the way you'd like, uh, because it comes from a governor's order. Uh, executive order and the governor's executive order authorizes the governing body to um, make the to make changes and impose additional restrictions. So that's what we're basing it on. So uh, that that's your role is to it it doesn't go into effect until the council approves it, and if the council doesn't approve it, the existing executive order remains in effect. And uh, thank you for that. And I did 
want to note that the opening statement that I had was the introduction for us sitting as the Board of Health. And then after this public hearing, we'll obviously introduce the council introduction as well. But we did introduce this as a Board of Health. And with that, Council Member Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you to everybody for testifying today. You know, this isn't easy. And certainly one in which we're trying to lead by keeping people safe. I want to send a special shout out to a friend of mine who's probably watching who has contracted COVID. They are scared to death. And rightfully so. This is real. And I hope that people understand that we are trying to keep people safe. We are trying to lead by ensuring, and this person, let me just be very clear, this person who wore their mask, who avoided lots of situations of being around other people, did the things that we were telling them to do. And it still happens. And that's what we are trying to make sure that we try to avoid. So, Mr. President, if it's possible, I want to address two things. One, relating to our child care centers, because I know that there was a letter requesting a waiver that was sent by the county executive to MSDE superintendent, Dr. Karen Salmon, asking her to establish an accommodation form waiver for us to allow 15 people maximum and so that we don't actually have to be limited by the coma restrictions of the one to 10 teacher child ratio. I know the huge impact that's going to have. I've heard from many who've reached out to me. I appreciate, for example, Mr. Rose and the commentary. I do agree that we need to make sure that we have additional data. And to that end, that actually will then spin me into my next part of the conversation, because I've heard a lot of conversation today about how, oh, there's not a lot of the cases. There aren't any cases that we've heard of in sports. And in fact, when I was on the phone with AISGW, the independent schools, the independent schools told me on the call that the majority of cases that they've had in school have come from their students participating in sports. So there's obviously a disconnect here between a conversation saying that sports aren't contributing to the spread. And I have independent schools that are saying, look, we're doing the right thing in our schools, but we can't control them outside of the school. And they go and participate in these sports. And that's where they're actually contracting the coronavirus. So let me turn to Dr. Gales, because Dr. Gales certainly has the information, has the data. And I'd like to hear from you, sir. Which one is it? Which which story is the actual truth here in terms of what we're seeing with transmission, not just between zero to 19, but if you can drill down a little bit more in terms of what it is that we're seeing, where we're seeing the trends, where we're seeing some of the concern. Sure. Well, before I answer that question, I wanted to clarify, Council President Katz, if we would be having the opportunity to speak broader about the host of the different things that were brought up in testimony, or should we just answer specific questions? Absolutely. But you are garbled slightly. So if you are more than welcome to speak on any on any of this topic, please. OK, I just wanted to respect the time limit. So hopefully you can hear me better now. So as it always great to be with you, I do have more of a formal presentation in terms of updates about the data. But to Council Member Rice's specific question, we have had so child care facilities have been open, as I said, throughout the pandemic, and we've been greatly appreciative of the services that they've provided. We do, at least from a health perspective, we do very much recognize the value of them being frontline workers and providing a much needed service to to the community. Now, that said, and we are extremely thankful for all of the facilities that have demonstrated great practices in terms of keeping their staff and children safe. And for those on the call, we applaud and are great to hear that there there haven't been any cases there. We are responsible for looking across the broad spectrum, though, of all of the providers for the county. And we have had cases involving child care facilities. And when those situations have happened, our disease control staff has worked closely and carefully with those facilities to implement 
appropriate practices uh, and provide the guidance whether or not they needed to be closed down or uh, small groups needed to be quarantined uh, and isolated. So I do want to clarify that and, and we can work to, to get that information to you. So it's, every, it's not that we haven't had zero cases of transmission in those settings. Now to pivot, the reason why the child care capacity limits were put into place by MSDE and the state from the beginning was due to community transmission levels. So back in the, uh, the early stages of the pandemic, when child care facilities were allowed to be open, they all, the capacity limits were put into place respective of the uh, transmission levels and COVID case levels throughout the, um, throughout the state. Now, phase two, which is where we have operated for, uh, for a long period of time, consistent with the state, has been into effect, again, for, for a long time. And we've not made any changes to that. And unfortunately, I think there was some, some unfortunately, the clarification came out. What the executive order is basically saying is that we would hold where we are. We wouldn't make any changes to that. And certainly, again, I can provide the, that more, more information related to our current case level. Where we stand, the, the case levels have increased, actually. And there is potential, I'm not sure, but... The, the capacity limits may be put back into place from MSDE's perspective based upon where the case counts are regionally, locally, and at the state level. So I just wanted folks to understand why though that recommendation was in place to stay where we are based upon our community transmission levels. It is not meant in any way to slight the effectiveness of the different practices that have been put into place. And as, as you mentioned, there has been a waiver requested from the county executive to Dr. Salmon uh, to be able to keep the ratios where they are. Now, the, to the second piece of your question related to sports activities, we have seen um, outbreaks of cases involving at least four different sports categories. We've seen uh, multiple cases involving club soccer. We've seen cases involving basketball, cheerleading, uh, as well as baseball. Uh, and we have had uh, reports of student athletes who have been in our county who participated in travel teams and club sports in other areas, including I think there was an outbreak of cases affiliated with a lacrosse tournament in another part of the state. So we do have documentation that does show that there has been transmission involving those activities. Our teams have investigated. And also to your point, we do know that that spills over into our school settings. So the uh, sports exam investigations that we've had have also moved into our um, non-public school settings where we have seen uh, uh, sports have to be quarantined and postponed indefinitely uh, due to those potential exposures. And you referenced the, AI, the AISDW schools. I actually had a conversation with them earlier this week to address that very same concern to talk about what types of practices needed to be in place to help protect the student athletes and the rest of their students in their school from you know, their potential exposures to those outside activities. So it's a long answer, but hopefully address those two key points from your question. No, it definitely does, Dr. Gales, and I really appreciate it because at the end of the day, look, and I hope that the folks who are who may still be on the line understand this is not easy. This is not something where we wish to just shut down things and say that we don't want folks to have, um, you know, uh, the ability to make an income, the ability to have uh, some outlets for their children. Uh, I've, I've got a teenage daughter at home. And I know that it frustrates her tremendously to not be able uh, to be with her friends, to do the things that she's used to doing. She actually played club soccer. Uh, so I know all too well about what that means. Um, but I will tell you this, that my, for me, and I'm just speaking as an individual council member, what will always lead first and foremost is the safety and well-being of our constituents. And so from that perspective, I find myself supportive of this. Dr. Gales, I really appreciate you always being able to give us quality data and information that we can depend on to be able to make a well-educated decision. So just want to say thank you, sir, for that. I yield back, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Council Member Friedson. Thank you, Council President. I uh, uh, have a number of questions specifically about the order. The first question is, uh, my understanding is, since we're not voting on this today and only last three days, that a new order will have to be uh, issued, uh, presumably on Monday, is that accurate? And what would the effective date be for that order? 
Are you asking me or are you asking? You or staff? I can take a shot at that. There certainly would have to be an amended order because the order that we got says it would be effective tomorrow at 5 p.m. That's obviously not going to happen if you don't vote today. So at the very least, if they don't change anything, they would have to change that. If they didn't change, if they didn't send over a brand new one, it's still, we could probably just adopt a resolution that makes it effective on some other time, you know, after Tuesday or Wednesday. I guess we probably could. But how do we make changes to an order when we're not? We can't make changes to the order. We would just change the effective date, say we're approving it, but it's not effective until such and such a day. But I think we would probably ask them to send over a revised one. Okay. Does the executive branch have an anticipation of when the effective date would be based on the fact that we're not voting today? Can we hear from the executive branch? I just mean. You vote. Likely 5 p.m. the day you vote. So we would need to know the day that you would vote. We'd have it be effective the day you vote. Okay. Anticipation is 5 p.m. Tuesday. Is that correct? I just think it's important for the public to know what we're talking about here. So 5 p.m. Tuesday for those who are watching. Appreciate that. Okay. On the child care piece of this, you know, I raised these internally, Dr. Stoddard. I appreciate you and others stepping up and addressing the issues. I am concerned about the way in which we got to the issues, which I believe was a lack of communication within the executive branch and with external stakeholders. So I just want to make sure on that, that, you know, how are we going to address those communications issues to ensure that when we do put in place these life altering public health directives that we, you know, understand that they're doing what they're intended to do and that they are being, you know, written in a way that, you know, and that has a full appreciation for the impact that they're going to have. And then related to that, the data question of whether we can parse out the data, as was mentioned by Mr. Rose earlier, for, you know, preschool age zero to six and then school aged, you know, seven to 19 or something in that manner. I'll be happy to take a stab at that. So the first, to your second question related to data, that's not a problem. We can drill down that and break that information down more specifically. But would like to address the question related to the communication. So just to be clear, again, that in this situation, I think there was some misinterpretation or misunderstanding. The recommendation is, again, not to change where we stand in terms of child care, to stay where we are and where we have been for months now. And when that was, when the governor's decision on October 1st made the announcement to return to Comar, we sent an email alert to child care providers on October 4th that said we would be holding and recommending that we hold at phase two. A press release was sent out on October 6th that also gave further details about that. And then an additional word document was sent from MSDE with guidance to providers on later on that week. So I just want, again, to clarify that in terms of what has been communicated and transmitted, at least from the health perspective, was communicated over a month ago. And again, I do recognize that there was some confusion related to how it was presented in the executive order originally. But again, just to clarify that the recommendation is to stay where we have been. It's not saying cut current capacity even further. And again, as has been mentioned, that a waiver was requested from the state to consider to address those concerns that were brought up related to the ratio requirements effective at the end of the month. Yeah, I appreciate that that communication occurred. I appreciate the fact that the waiver is being requested, which we all hope will be accepted by MSDE in the state. I think the concern that I have, and I don't want to dwell on this too much longer, is the language of the order that was issued that has caused a tremendous amount of confusion and disruption for providers and for families did not reflect what the intention was, which was to do exactly what you've stated and which you've been consistent on, which is staying in phase two for the reasons that you've stated. That is the area where I think 
uh, communication uh, shortcomings uh, came, it didn't appear that the subject matter experts within the executive branch even uh, were uh, properly consulted to fully understand what this order was going to say and, and what it meant to make sure that it did what was intended. And now I, I appreciate the fact that we have cleared it up, but, but it has caused you know, quite a bit of confusion and disruption that I think could have been avoided. And so I just hope that we have a system in place uh, and it's not necessarily your job, uh, you know, Dr. Gales, to be very specific about this, uh, but to make sure that we're having that internal communication uh, to make sure that the orders are doing uh, what they are. You know, I, you are an expert in a lot of things, but you're not an expert, you know, understandably in everything that we have to make decisions on. And so I just think that the uh, executive branch should be putting to bear all of the resources that we have within county government and with all of the recovery work groups even uh, to make sure that uh, the d desired outcome to keep people safe, which is what you are working diligently day and night uh, to do is being achieved by the legal language that is being placed to take public health directives, turn it into legal language, which has practical impacts uh, in the real world. And we have to make sure all of those three parts are, are, are moving together. So I hope that Council member, a better uh, system. Yeah, Councilor, for, for I, wanted to add, I wanted to add into this. So, at the direction of the county executive and the chief administrative officer, we have uh, we have since this happened early this week, put in some additional checks and balances in our executive order process that allow that that basically adds in uh, a subject matter review, just as you suggested. So, uh, we right. agree that it added to the confusion, did not help the confusion, but we're we are going to address that internal process. So, I wanted to make sure that was clear. Terrific. I spoke directly with the CAO, and I'm glad to hear that that is already moving. I appreciate that response. Thank you very much. Um, on the contact tracing with the uh, um, the 25%, can you specifically explain uh, with uh, uh, restaurants and the other impacted facilities at the 25% capacity and what the contact tracing uh, data is uh, being used and the specific metrics that are being used to make that determination? There's been some concern and confusion. I just wanted to give an opportunity to make sure that that was clear for folks of what that's based off of. So again, we've we've been very open and transparent about our data dashboard uh, and the measures we're using to guide these decisions. We've also, in the last several weeks, been very clear with you all as well as the public in terms of what we would recommend most likely as a first phase of efforts to curb uh, an increase in cases. Uh, and so, when we're talking about 25% versus 50% as a as a history. Reminder, that's where we were in our previous uh, provisions. So we've all, and if you go back and look at our phases of reopening, we've used the 25%. We used, we went from zero to 25, and then we went up to 50%. And so these are the measures that we have used throughout the pandemic to guide us. They're similar to the measures that have been put into place at the state level and many other jurisdictions in the region uh, in terms of provisions of reopening. So we didn't arbitrarily create 25% again. These are just saying, okay, we're going to look at capacity limits where we were at in previous phases due to the levels of community transmission. So that's why we were currently sitting at 50%. We cut back again to try to arrest the increase in cases. And if you will permit me a little bit, indulge me a little bit, I don't want to take up your time or allotment from uh, Council President Katz, but I do think it would be helpful to mention more specifics about the data to help folks at home understand why we would recommend it make going back to uh, these different levels. Um, is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, all right. Just wanted to, I don't want to, I don't want to eat up anyone's time. No, no, no. We're, I didn't put anybody on a five-minute rule, okay. so we're good. All right. Just want to make sure. Hey, I know that. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, again, so we, we met several weeks ago to discuss and, you know, have had these ongoing conversations regarding our metrics and our dashboard. And, you know, at least several weeks ago, and even in our, both, again, public uh, and press briefings and conversations, and even in our briefings with you all, we've talked about those likely actions being tied to capacity limits as opposed to, uh, offering recommendations to close things down entirely. 
Uh, and we've had numerous updates to show that if the data moved in that direction, that that would be the level of activity that we would need to take to arrest that increase to prevent us from getting to a level where we see case counts where you're not really left with much action but to have to make larger recommendations of closing down. Now, the state roadmap, uh, to quote Governor Hogan's uh, return to recovery at, uh, roadmap, lists a series of different requirements um, as stop signs. That's how they're characterized. That states, uh, some of the criteria state significant outbreaks of a community transmission where contact tracing can't establish the route of spread or that's not in a congregate living situation and or a sustained increase in cases over a period of five or more days requires the reimposition of some prior restrictions. And the prior restrictions, to get to your point related to percentages, the prior restrictions for us were related to those uh, capacity limits tied to percentages or numbers. Now, in the last couple of weeks, again, just to highlight the state from the statewide surveillance level, we've seen an increase in case counts. Um, most cases, we've seen the most cases now in this time period than since the beginning of August. Uh, and it's important to note that yesterday we had 1,000 cases. Today we had 1,198 cases, including 227 on a local level. The 227 reported for us is the highest that we've seen since the beginning of June when we were at the, uh, we were coming off our surge of cases back then. 20 counties have had increases in their case rate. 18 of the 24 counties and jurisdictions in the state have over 10 cases per 100,000. Uh, and eight of those uh, jurisdictions actually have greater than 15 cases per 100,000. Um, the positivity for the, te the state is over four. Cases for the whole state now are at 15 per 100,000. And outbreaks that we've seen across the state have increased by 10% uh, over the last week. Now, regionally, we've seen an increase in cases of 15 to 20 percent over the past seven days. And again, from a local level, our test positivity has increased by one point just in the last week from 2.5 to 3.5, which is a trend that we don't like to see. Our rate of transmission value continues to be greater than one. And our cases per 100,000 have increased from, I think it was uh, in the seven, seven point something range over a week and a half ago to now we're at 13.4. So that's why we are, we have put forward these recommendations and again, consistent with the conversations that we have had uh, and all of our discussions over the last several weeks. That's the framework and context behind what is driving these recommendations. They are not arbitrary. Again, the recommendations are capacity limits across the board. We're not picking or recommending one particular business versus the other. It's saying, here's what we're recommending that we need to do based upon our capacity limits that were previously set in our previous phases to hopefully decrease the cases and turn us back in the other direction so that we don't see a larger increase in cases that would need to cause um, a higher level of provisions to be put into place. And I think it's also important to know if I'll just add this one thing, the longer we wait to implement these types of restrictions or guidelines, we run the risk of seeing the cases increase even more. And so we move from a baseline of where we're now seeing 100, 120 to 160 with a day of 220, hopefully being a novelty, to the point where next week we could be talking about seeing uh, cases in the higher hundred, higher 100s or even the low 200s on a daily baseline level. Appreciate the time. Sorry, go ahead. I, yeah, if I may, just to add, we look, we look at the contact tracing on a weekly basis and it's important to recognize that we have not seen some eureka moment where we look at the contact tracing saying, aha, this area is where we're seeing a dramatic increase in cases and none of these other areas are seeing an increase. The, the, the relative ratios are staying roughly equal to one another with some small, small changes. For example, we are seeing an increase in indoor dining as we see a decrease in outdoor dining. And that's the, to be expected as the weather gets cooler, more people are going to dine indoors than dine outdoors. So we're seeing that shift in the data, which actually tells us the data is actually measuring something that's real. Uh, we've seen a small shift in our houses of worship. There has been an increase of about 5% since August in the contribution of outdoor, uh, or sorry, uh, houses of worship in the, in the total, in the overcase lab. That said, everything else has stayed mostly constant, 
where we see increases across the board in all of those areas uh, near equally because we're seeing an increase in community transmission. So it's not like we can say this one particular uh, industry is causing our increase. It is across the board increases in community transmission that are being reflected then in the activities that people have been doing and therefore, you know, driving those, you know, driving issues continuously across the board. So I think it's just so really important to understand. The goal is the community transmission suppression and it's not, yes. uh, it's, it's not industry specific. That's your, that's your point you're trying to make. Okay, I appreciate Correct. that context. Uh, a, a few specific follow-up questions to the order itself. Uh, on the restaurant, the food service uh, uh, component, I don't think this was intended, but it reads as if carry out, drive through um, or delivery uh, has to cease operations at 10 p.m. Um, is that is that true that rest, sit down restaurants can operate after 10 p.m. as long as they're not selling alcohol, but uh, carry out, drive through and delivery has to stop at 10 p.m.? Is that the intention? So uh, we, we heard we heard a bit about this, and, and as Mr. Grummer said, I think we're going to have to send over a, a new EOV just to change the effective date, but I think to maybe clean up a couple of these things. It was not our intention to stop takeout dining at 10 p.m. It was our intention to stop takeout alcohol at 10 p.m. Because what we're having happen is people take alcohol outside of the space of the restaurant and go to our streeteries and essentially um, break all the rules, including underage consumption. Frankly, we found a fair bit of that in our streeteries. Uh, so we're having a lot of issues with compliance in our streeteries from these takeouts. Now, delivery, obviously, 10 o'clock should that should not, we're going we're to correct that. Delivery should be fine after 10 o'clock to someone's home to consume alcohol or otherwise in the, in the, it, while, you know, physically distancing. But we are seeing issues with people taking out alcohol from restaurants, taking it slightly off property to the public space, and then consuming it in a manner, it, you know, the consumption of the alcohol is not necessarily the problem. It's the behaviors that the alcohol consumption contributes to that's the problem. And that's what we're seeing in, in our enforcement side is we're having a lot of problems in our streeteries with people taking alcohol off premise, right. breaking all the physical distancing and face covering requirements outside the space of the restaurant, which is not the restaurant's fault per se, but we've got to curb that uh, activity. Yeah, I think uh, I so, need to be cleaned up and just clarifying off premise, uh, you know, is, you know, it need, needs to be uh, clarified there because there's a lot of confusion uh, on that. Understood. Obviously, a lot of people who use uh, food service, uh, you know, uh, uh, drive through after 10 p.m. or service workers, essential employees, yes. healthcare workers, and the idea that we'd be denying them the ability to get dinner after their shift, uh, you know, late at night, uh, if need be, uh, seems like an unintended uh, situation there. Um, we agree. On the contact tracing piece, I totally support this. DC's been doing this for quite a long time, and it seems very reasonable. Uh, and helpful uh, to, to, to do that uh, in order to address some of these issues. Uh, there has been a question about uh, carry out only type of businesses, which is really more similar uh, to a retail establishment and no different from going to Bethesda Bagel and getting a bagel versus going to get an iPhone. Um, does a takeout only business as opposed to an on-premise consumption uh, uh, a food service business, are they also required to uh, take the, contact tracing information? Well, I think if, if someone's coming in just for a quick transaction, then, you know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't qualify for, you know, the spirit of what we're hoping to capture, you know, by getting that contact tracing information. So, you know, that can be some clarifying language that's put in the messaging that goes out to them uh, in terms of the expectation of getting that information for from the folks who are seated and eating in that space. Yeah. Sit down, done. Okay, that would be great. I, there was just some question and, and confusion about that, so I think clarifying that would be uh, would be uh, uh, very helpful. Um, last piece uh, on gatherings: uh, the 25 versus uh, 50. We're we're not differentiating between indoor and outdoor. Is that correct? Because no. gathering is a gathering. Is there a reason? I mean, we just I just would like to understand this a little bit. It seems very clear from everything that we've heard from you and we've seen from others that indoor is a much more dangerous activity than outdoor for a variety of different uh, 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 different reasons. So it would seem to me that one, we would reflect that in the restrictions based on the 
the, 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 the health uh, data and the risk factors, or and or number two, we would um, want to incentivize the same activity with the same number of people being outdoor versus indoor if outdoor is inherently uh, uh, a lower risk for transmission. I just wanted to get a sense for you know why we don't differentiate between an indoor gathering and an outdoor gathering. Well, part of the reason why we don't is again going back to the you know the fundamentals of the the, the no, no, notion of transmission, and so you know the goal of putting in these restrictions is to minimize contact points where people are coming into contact with each other. And you know, you reference contact tracing data. Contact tracing data has been showing that larger gatherings has been of concern, and those are the types of events that have most frequently shown up in contact tracing investigations when people do test positive. And so that is that has led to that the rationale behind putting in those limits and restrictions uh, within those spaces again to drive the numbers down. Um, and I think again, if we're successful in being able to do that, that gives us the opportunity to again be able to return back to some of our uh, you know our original levels because right now our social gathering is capped at fifty. And so, you know, that it's the same principle in terms of, I know that at the state level, there are much more generous provisions for social gatherings. Um, but, you know, as it stands for us is, again, the goal is to cut down on those activities that we do know carry the highest risk of, of transmission. And I think it's also important to note that, again, we're not saying everybody is going around recklessly, having groups, doing those types of things. The issue becomes is our guidance has to be provided for everybody. And again, when we look at the information, social gatherings and larger gatherings continues to show up as the leading uh, source, if you will, um, of, or most frequent place that people um, report that they have been when they do their contact tracing uh, investigation. Just last question related to this. Does the contact tracing show that it's formal, uh, organizational uh, gatherings, you know, uh, events, uh, things like sports, things like uh, formal activities at an arts institute or something that is outside um, versus an informal gathering, like a family getting together, or a group of friends getting together? I know you've frequently referenced the kind of informal social gathering, including a, a family event, a birthday, uh, and people being uh, more casual with that than they had been earlier on in, in, in the virus. But is the, 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 does the contact tracing show that the formal activities um, being as much of an issue as the informal social gathering piece that it sounds like we're trying to mitigate here? So the, the, the contact tracing doesn't differentiate, you know, apples to apples to say, you know, this in the congregate the aggregate setting however you know when we have done our contact tracing interviews we have had examples of cases where folks have been in family gatherings informal gatherings they've also we've had evidence where there have been formal settings where people also have come into contact and there's been some risk of transmission in those settings as well i think if you look at the data uh i believe it's roughly 35 percent of of, of people who have COVID have an association with a family gathering, which means that 65% of people do not. And so that, you know, while it's the largest category for family gatherings, uh, you know, I think houses of worship are something like 23%. Uh, and, um, you know, you know, 18% for something else and 15% for something else. And so it, it is, while it may be the largest for family gatherings, and it is the largest for family gatherings in terms of high risk gathering locations, um, it's certainly not even a preponderance of people have gone to a family gathering. It, it's just the, mo the of a series of factors. It's the most commonly, uh, it's the most commonly associated factor of gathering. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Councilmember Uh Okay. Thanks, Mr. President. So I want to start in the same place that my colleague and friend, Councilmember Rice, started. Um, and that's just acknowledging that we know the pain that is being felt by our community. We know the businesses that are hanging on by a thread. Uh, we get the constituent calls. We have seen the heartbreaking story after heartbreaking story, and this is impacting us personally as well. I have family that have lost jobs. 
Uh, I have ham had family who have had to let people go. Um, and so I just want our public to understand that we hear you. We feel your pain authentically, sincerely, and deeply. Um, and these are extraordinarily difficult decisions. And we are undeniably stuck between a rock and a hard place because we're doing everything that we can to keep everyone safe, acknowledging that we're not gonna get everything right. This has been a moving target from the very beginning. There are many factors that are out of our control, but those factors that are within our control, I think it's reasonable for us to take appropriate action to address the community spread issues that are alarming and that are heading in the right direction. And as you look at the bellwethers in other parts of the world, as an example, Europe, which was uh, hit before the United States, New York, which was hit before the state of Maryland and our region, as we have been warned from the very beginning by our public health officials, from Dr. Fauci to Dr. Gales, at the state level and on down, as the temperatures were getting colder, as we started to see people with a little bit of COVID fatigue and letting down their guard because of the confusing and incorrect rhetoric being sent at the highest levels of our government, including our president. Uh, it has contributed to the challenges that we are expressing and feeling now. That context is really important uh, because, you know, this conversation was inevitable uh, and painful to say the least. Now, we still must go through these recommendations and line items. And as we look at the various recommendations and we ask questions, it's not in the spirit of questioning the validity or the competence of our team, which there is no question about. We have among the best public health teams in the country right here in Montgomery County. It's just collectively between the executive and legislative branch working collaboratively as we have done since the beginning of the pandemic to try and address the complex and unique needs of our residents across the board. So again, just wanted to provide that context uh, before going into my questions, um, because I agree in principle, no question, um, that we have to start moving in the direction of having to scale back. Um, but I did have a couple of questions. Um, one is, you know, clearly a number of different organizations and sectors within our community are gonna be impacted by this executive order. And the, the timing is never going to be perfect. Um, but I think one of the pieces of feedback that I've received, which I don't think is unreasonable, is, is there some reasonable threshold moving forward as we look at scaling things back um, that can provide a little bit more leeway or runway um, for businesses to transition backwards. So for example, um, had we voted on this today, it would have been implemented tomorrow night. It would have very significantly impacted the number of businesses in our area with not a lot of time to make the adjustments necessary from a personnel or staffing standpoint. And so I guess this is probably a question, uh, well, for both of you, um, but is there uh, some time frame that we look at in issuing in an executive order that we have found to be a best practice in other jurisdictions that gives businesses um, a reasonable amount of time to make these adjustments while also taking into account um, that, you know, the numbers are going up and they're going up rapidly? Um, it, you know, th this would have been, I think, um, less than five days. Um, is, is that a target? Is that something we should think about moving forward, setting some reasonable expectation for businesses once an executive order goes out uh, and giving them the time to be able to adjust and accommodate uh, the order? It's a tricky, it's tricky answer. Um, and I think that because first off, I think once we make a decision that it's in the public health interest to move backwards, it, days, will matter. I mean, obviously what goes on this weekend will contribute to cases for the next two weeks. I think that do need to be very clear about that. And so what's likely to happen is we, you know, the, whatever decision you all make next week, we will, it will take two weeks to see any benefit from that at all. Meaning we will continue to see escalation of cases for weeks after. And so 
uh, I, I think your, your point is extremely well taken and what we can probably try and do is be a bit more forthcoming with regard to what, you know, I think we've been talking a lot about rolling back. I think we've been giving ideas of where we're going to roll back, but I, I, it's going to be very difficult for us to balance the public health immediacy once an action is deemed necessary to pausing that action for a period of public review while the activity that we deem to be unsafe continues. And I think that's the tricky balance and you've correct, you've rightly uh, noted that. And so I think that we can attempt to, to, to give a little bit more lead time, but at the same time, it will not be what we would like to do, which is provide weeks of notice. We, we in, all, in all of our efforts, we all want to provide plenty of notice for public comment and public reaction and businesses to respond. But obviously we are still in an emergency situation, so it, it does not afford us the opportunities we would like to have under other circumstances. So um, we could take back, we'll have a discussion about how we can maybe try and do a little bit more. I mean, for example, and, and like we don't want to, we do not want this to be the case. We have to start thinking now about what the next step is to, you know, once you all take action on, on this current step, just because I think we just need to understand what that would look like, how that would be implemented. And as we do that, I think we're going to continue to have public discourse saying, like, we do not want to have to do these actions to close down businesses. We do not want you to have, we know how hard it is for the county executive, we know how hard it is for the county council to take these actions. We are, we do not want to take them. Uh, but what we need to start planning for what you know, what scenarios could happen. And I think in doing that, we can be a little bit more communicative about exactly the kinds of things we're talking about for future executive orders. They're not going to be things that are going to be incredibly popular and they're going to be very hard things for our businesses. And we recognize that, but um, I certainly think we'll make an effort to be a little bit more um, overt about exactly the kinds of things that we're looking to do and our timelines for doing them. Super helpful, and I, I really appreciate that response. Um, and again, I know we're doing the best we can. A um, few other questions. One, uh, totally support the request of the waiver to MSDE. Makes all the sense in the world. Um, and I appreciate the clarification that was sent out regarding the executive order. Um, but if do we have a sense of when they will review this waiver and make a decision? Are we talking about days? Are we talking about weeks? Um, because obviously we need to give our child care providers lead time there as well to notify parents um, if they are going to have to reduce their capacities because they can't financially viably bring on a second person. Those families are going to need as much lead time as possible to find other accommodations. So has, has MSDE given a sense of when they may respond to the waiver request or have we seen a trend with other waiver requests on what we can anticipate? Uh, I don't know. The, yeah. I don't think there's been any, any indication or response levied yet. Again, I think that um, you know, for the folks at home and for the folks on the call, you know, the facilities, I think as part of their discussion, you know, again, when that that decision was made to increase capacity or return it back to the original pre-pandemic capacity levels, we were at a very different level on a local level as well as a state level, and so I would venture to say um, that, or at least I would hope that they would think through where we stand in terms of our community transmission levels, in terms of where that guidance, what that guidance would look like for the state as well as the local jurisdiction. So the short answer is we don't have any indication. We certainly hope to hear that sooner than later for the reasons that you laid out. Uh, but also at the same time, I think it is important again for folks to understand that those decisions related to capacity were made due to case levels and community transmission. And given that, I would, would hope and wager to say that they would likely be thinking through where we sit right now in terms of that further guidance. I could also work. That. Yep, go ahead. We could also work through our state delegation as well to continue to get answers, help us get answers through MSD. I think that's an entirely appropriate thing because I agree that we, would, we definitely would like to know by mid-November about something that's going to be happening at the end of November and to give enough notice for, for families, facilities as well, uh, the lead time to do what they would need to do to, to be in compliance yeah, in either Dr. direction. Dr. Sutton, I don't mean to cut in uh, here, Councilmember Albernaz, but uh, Delegate Solomon and Delegate Kelly, who have both been working a lot on child care issues, um, we've been in touch with them directly on this, and I'd be happy to touch base with you offline and make sure that you all and they are directly connected so that we can all be working together on this. Thank you. And 
you know, obviously we're hoping for the best in terms of that waiver, but if it doesn't come through, you know, we are going to need to talk about a plan B. Uh, and I, for one, am uh, just speaking for myself, you know, very uncomfortable with the notion that as many as, you know, four kids per each of these classrooms and literally hundreds and thousands of hundreds of families are going to be impacted by this and there isn't capacity in other places. So I totally agree with you, Dr. Gills. I hope that our state makes a decision that's consistent with the community spread issues that we're seeing across the board. Um, but if they remain in phase three and we remain in phase two and they don't grant the waiver, then there are hundreds of families, thousands of families who are not going to have a placement or a location. Uh, and we've seen the overall number of childcare facilities go down uh, because of the financial implications for them. So I know it's something we're thinking about, but it is something we're gonna have to revisit from an executive order standpoint and possibly make adjustments um, because you know, the alternative is, neither alternative is great. Um, so it's almost like picking your least worst option at that point. Um, so we'll, we'll see, but anyways, that, that's more of a comment. Um, and I also want to very much associate myself again with my colleague, Council Member Rice, um, um, and, and you had agreed uh, as well, Dr. Gales, um, more information is, is very helpful uh, for our residents. And I think we've done an extraordinary job with contact tracing and now have a lot more data today uh, accessible than we did previously. And I think where we can provide examples where there have been cases of a community spread whether it's a sport or a restaurant or a religious gathering, I think our residents, without getting into specifics on, you know, that don't cross over into, um, you know, people's confidentiality issues, I think residents want to know information like that. Um, and, and I think it would be helpful in the residents' decision-making process in deciding which activities to sign their children up for, where to go out uh, on a Saturday night, um, and so if we have that information available, I think it would be reasonable for us to include that um, in our dashboard, uh, just something a little bit more granular, as there is frustration from a number of folks in the sectors that say, well, you know, we're, we're doing everything right. Um, but, you know, you had mentioned the child care facilities that, you know, have tested positive, and there may be others that just don't know that. Uh, and so, uh, or may not be on the calls that you are providing, I know, on a daily and weekly basis to these various sectors. Um, so I think that that would be helpful and important. Um, you know, because for example, within sports, I'm just gonna say my son plays baseball. Uh, they play with masks. Um, and there was an incident in his league in which another team had to cancel a game because a coach and a player tested mm -hmm. positive. Now they didn't, it turns out, it wasn't from baseball. Uh, you know, they, they had gone to a family function, uh, and that's where they got it. Um, and then, you know, so it wasn't spread through actually playing baseball. Um, but I think it's important to, you know, denote situations like that um, in, in order for us to, to give more information to the public so that they can make, you know, these informed decisions. Um, I, if I may, Council Member Auburn, I think it's also important to understand we don't know where all of our cases are at at all times, too. Right. Right. Our, our test positivity is increasing at, in spite of our fact that we're doing more testing, which tells us that there's actually more community spread that we're not aware of than several months ago. And so I think that's important context, too, so that, you know, we can assert a oh, contact tracing data has said X, Y, and Z. But in order for contact tracing data to even exist for a particular person, we have to know they have it. And the testing positivity number tells we know, we don't know everything that's going on in the community. We just know it's not good based on the numbers that we're seeing. I appreciate that. And then my final point, uh, and, and I wanna thank you, Mr. Council President. I think the not having the five minute rule today was important because of the number of questions we got here. Um, and that's this, you know, it takes me literally 11 minutes door to door to drive to the District of Columbia from my house. It takes me 25 minutes to drive to Prince George's County. It takes me, I think, 31 minutes to go to Northern Virginia. We've been working closely regionally um, with other jurisdictions to uh, have strong cooperation in terms of um, both reopening and closures. Can you talk a little bit, Dr. Gales, about the coordination on this specific executive order and decision because while, again, I agree in principle with the decision for us to scale back, 
if other local jurisdictions don't follow suit, then it very much limits the impact of our scaling back because people will just cross over uh, to go to a restaurant that has 50% capacity just in another part of the region or participate in an activity that we're restricting, but they can easily participate in, you know, less than a half an hour away from here. So where are we with the regional cooperation on this particular rollback and what are you hearing from other jurisdictions? Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. So I think the first principle is, again, for, for folks at home, uh, just know that any advice and guidance that comes from the health perspective is something that has been very carefully thought out in terms of our own internal research efforts and looking at other jurisdictions for best practices, as well as discussed with our regional, our local partners, as well as our partners at the state. So whenever you hear us put something out or say, this is what we're recommending where we should go, you can trust that it has been very carefully vetted and looked at from many different angles from all of those different perspectives. So as it relates to uh, closure provisions, so much like when we had our uh, conversation several weeks ago to talk about our revamped metrics, our revamped dashboard, uh, and the types of provisions that we would be looking at, uh, and I laughed as I mentioned this on other calls, I remember very clearly because I was technically on vacation when we had the conversation. Uh, but similar to that, we uh, initiated conversations with the health officers from the National Capital Region several weeks ago to say, hey, we kind of see the wind's blowing a little bit. You know, are you seeing this in your jurisdictions? And what's the type of conversation you're having? What's the type of decisions that you're thinking about making? And so similar, the documents that were shared with you all and shared as we've reviewed over the last several weeks uh, were also shared with other jurisdictions as a starting point to say, hey, you know, what were you all thinking about doing? So we've, ha we've been having those ongoing conversations with the National Capital Region folks, again, recognizing there's some differences in terms of authority. For example, the, the Northern Virginia Health Officers um, don't have quite the same provisions to implement strategies like we do. They have to go through the state in a different way. Um, and in addition to that, we have been talking about that with the state health officers in Maryland. Uh, and even as recently as this week, we uh, met with the secretary to say, you know, we're concerned. The numbers are increasing. What is the state's response and how will we move forward? Because again, I want folks at home again to understand this is not just an issue for Montgomery County or Prince George's County. This is an issue for smaller counties as well. Everyone is seeing an increase in cases and everyone's seeing an increase in their rates. And so because of that, uh, we recognize that even though each of the different jurisdictions may have some surveillance specific um, needs based upon their local contact tracing data, we also recognize that it would benefit to your point because everybody moves back and forth. It would be very beneficial to have some standardized language and guidelines from a state perspective, um, as well as a shared space from a regional perspective so that um, you know, we don't see what you described happening where I'm just going to go somewhere else where that activity would be permitted. I do know that there are close ju jurisdictions near us who are looking at implementing tighter restrictions. For example, while we're on this meeting, I just got a message to say that D.C. is imposing the requirement of testing for individuals coming from high um, risk areas into D.C., similar to what they're doing in New York. Um, and I know that at least uh, a couple of other counties are also looking at implementing uh, restrictions very similar to what we have proposed. I would also add a couple things. Um, we, uh, you know, Dr. Gales and I definitely understand how challenging this, this conversation is for our elected officials here in Montgomery County, across the state, other jurisdictions. There is the, the advice that you all are receiving from Dr. Gales and, and, and I is being paralleled by health officers across the state. There are certainly jurisdictions that this conversation is ongoing in and with whom the, you know, our um, guidelines are being reviewed. And frankly, I think many, there are several jurisdictions who are actively discussing doing something very, very similar. That said, there is a lot of trepidation in, in, in doing something that is going to, we know that this is going to have an economic impact and there's a lot of trepidation and, and anxiety amongst elected officials about doing that. Um, we believe that, uh, frankly, it's the right thing to do. I think the numbers in a month are gonna bear that out considerably that it was the right thing to do. 
And I think that this action that we may take here in Montgomery County is showing the kind of leadership statewide that will encourage other shared jurisdictions to take this hard decision themselves. And so I think that I, we 100% agree that regional activity is the best way to go. But, you know, um, and, and I don't want to for, 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 you know, reveal something that other jurisdictions may be announcing soon. But I think this is not, this is something that other jurisdictions are actively having a conversation around and are preparing to take action on. But also those jurisdictions who are more, having more trepidation will be encouraged to do so by our willingness to go ahead on this. And so just understand, I know this is going to be a very difficult, it was very difficult for the executive to propose. I know it'll be very difficult for you all to consider, but it, you know, as we do this, um, it will encourage other jurisdictions to do what the public health people are recommending that they do in their own counties and, and jurisdictions. So that's all I would want to say on that. Thank you both. And I'll just close with this. I mean, I'm, I'm confident when we review this on Tuesday with the amended language, it's going to go forward because I don't think you, you're going to find any disagreement uh, that, you know, we, we want to continue to be a leader and, and, and set the pace in many ways as we do in so many other areas. Um, but I think this has been helpful and productive both for our clarification, but also the community's clarification on some of these issues. And I'm sure my colleagues probably have other questions too, but um, I really appreciate this discussion. I think it's been productive. Thank you, Vice President Harper. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is a really helpful discussion. Unfortunately, I, I haven't struck many questions and I keep adding more the more I hear. So um, <clears throat> bear with me, but I uh, thank you for, um, for um, bringing this to us. Um, Obviously, we're all at a, the same very difficult place. Uh, we're very, um, we enthusiastically agree with the goal of, of driving down our, our cases and, and positivity level. Um, but, um, and the, the growth that we're seeing is, is, is very scary. But um, I, I have many, I've received many, like my colleagues, questions from constituents about why this approach makes the most sense as opposed to other things. So that'll, that's most of my questions. Um, First, on, on just to follow up on, on Gabe's um, colloquy about the, um, the communication with the public and your response, I get that this one, um, this executive order might be more difficult for all of us because we're sort of back to where we were in the spring. Things are getting worse and we're tightening uh, things up or the proposals to tighten things up rather than the last few. Um, and that's sort of a, you know, a, um, a return to, to reality um, that's just difficult. But I think if I remember from the spring, we talked about having, you know, even a chart where we could help to communicate with the public. If test positivity gets to this level, if number of cases get to this level, these, this is the waterfront of um, restrictions that you all are going to consider or propose. Um, and if they get worse by another level, here's another level. So that we could expect and the public could help to expect um, what we might see in the future, it might it might help to uh, increase people's buy-in um, or you know sense of comfort of of uh, just just seeing where this is all headed rather than encountering what we hear all the time, which is some of this seems arbitrary or we right or wrong that people didn't see this coming. Um, uh, to me, a chart like that would be helpful, and I bet to others. Um, can I ask about contact tracing? Um, maybe I haven't spent enough time with the data dashboard, but I haven't been able to find there. Earl just mentioned. 35% from family gatherings, 23% from houses of worship. Do we know how many cases come from retail restaurants? Well, I think it's, um, again, so, well, to the first point, that was our goal and to what you described with the new dashboard, you know, and, and reaching out to you all and others to get feedback to do that. That was our purpose to make something that was more palatable, digestible, and easier to understand. It's I think it's also tricky sometimes to when you, I think we try to be as, as, as transparent as we can in terms of the metrics guiding that. I think it's tricky sometimes when you put a hard and fast number because context matters. So for example, when we, uh, everyone gets fixated on test positivity and say, well, you know, the test positivity is not that high, so why are you taking steps back? Well, if you follow it, the test positivity actually is increasing. And when you compare it to where we were back in, let's say, July, when we were testing at comparable levels, we were seeing 40 and 50 cases a day. Now we're seeing 200, you know, to, for example, today we had 200. So it's it's a little different. And so 
we try to be informative and and put those markers where we can. But the challenge is, you know, being able to provide that additional context. But you know, we'll, as always, we will continue to refine and figure out how to best do that. So as it relates to the contact tracing piece, the way it's described is because community transmission is so significant. In the absence of a very clear case where we say, you know, Council Member Hucker was at Restaurant X is where he started having symptoms. We are pretty convinced that that's where the point of contact was. It gets tricky because, you know, we have folks who get interviewed and they say, well, I went to church, I was at a restaurant, I also may have gone to a gym. And when we present the data, it's more around the, when we interview or when positive cases have been interviewed, here's the percentage of folks who say they had, were in these spaces during the time where we think they were, were infectious. Um, so that's the challenge between, you know, unless it's a very clear case where we can say this is where the exposure was, that's, you know, kind of how it's, it's presented. And again, it just underscores that because community transmission levels are where they are, it makes it more challenging to identify the original root cause. Right. I, thank you. I, I, I definitely get the point about the um, dirtiness of the data pool. Um, and the clearest cases might be, I go to this restaurant, I, I uh, went home, I didn't go anywhere else for days, and I got, uh, I, I showed symptoms, right? Um, but I think, you know where I'm going, I think if we're going to continue to impose restrictions on people, they're going to want to see what that's, what that's based on and why that industry and not another industry. So let me, let me just move on and ask a couple of specific industries. Um, I definitely, um, I'm hearing a lot, we're all hearing a lot of concerns about childcare. Obviously, that's a really um, unique industry because it affects the availability of, of that service affects every other business uh, really in the economy. Um, do you have a reaction to the Yale study on child care where um, they conducted that large scale assessment and the claim of the study, I understand it, is that child care programs that remained open during the pandemic did not contribute significantly to the spread of the virus um, to providers. Have you looked at that? Well, yes, I mean, we, we've looked at a host of the studies and the challenge when looking at the studies is again, context matters. So much like, you know, we have uh, similar cases to say that, you know, you know, schools don't have, you know, kids aren't super, super spreaders or whatever. We do have cases that it's happening. And so that's the challenge behind it. And so again, the settings with, you know, we'll continue to review those and look at the guidance. Again, part of, of what drives the success of different programs and different practices, again, is the level of community transmission within a particular community. Because again, that increase, the higher your case numbers, the more likely you are to step into your child care facility, your school, your gym, your business, your restaurant with COVID. Uh, and I think this is a, as we continue to evolve in the response, I think it also you know, we've got to think about, you know, what the expectations are in terms of what would be acceptable. Because, you know, like I said, we, child care facilities overall have done a great job. We haven't seen a ton of cases, but we have seen them. And in some cases, we've, you know, we've had to shut down some places where there have been multiple cases involved. Right. So as those studies continue to pop out, you know, we'll continue to review them again and look at them within the context of our local jurisdiction in terms of how it could be applicable. Did you have any Thank response? You. Thank you. Uh, did you have any response, Dr. Gales, to um, Mr. Rose's comment that the data show increase in cases between age zero and 19, but had, we hadn't seen disaggregated data about zero to five, the kids that are actually in child care compared to middle school or high school age kids? Sure. I mean, as I said, we'd be happy to break that down further and provide that um, and to be able to document that's, that's not a problem. So, yeah, I, I, I think the key point with child care is we agree that they've been doing a good job. And in the face of, in the face of increasing cases, we're not actually, we simply are saying, let's stay where we're at, as opposed to going forward or rolling back in spite of the cases going and rapidly increasing. Uh, and so what we're, I mean, what all we've suggested is let's stay at phase two that the state proposed in the face of rapidly increasing cases. So I think, you know, I think that's just the, the key message here is, the, the child care providers have done a good job. We're not proposing we go back to phase one or, or, or an earlier phase, like we said. We're just saying we're not going to move forward, just as we've said in other places. Uh, we're not moving forward to phase three, and, and, and certainly this is not an area we're looking to move backwards in either. It's just we're looking to stay consistent with what we were doing and has been working since 
uh, much earlier in the pandemic under other circumstances. Right. I mean, no. Sorry. I, I thank you. I appreciate that. Um, this is a particularly sensitive industry. Obviously, we heard from some of the testimony today that um, some of their families are going to lose their child care, and that affects other areas of the economy if, if parents aren't able to go to work, obviously. Um, so that's that's an area, if they're doing a good job, you know, we obviously we want to be extra cautious. Um, and having the disaggregated data, I think, would help answer people's some people's questions. I had a couple of questions. Go ahead. Sorry. And just last point. Council Member Albrown's point is well taken that if we do not get this waiver from the state, we will like, we will have to revisit this and have a conversation about what that means. Because I, I, I would agree, the county executive would agree that we do not want to lose child care as an option in Montgomery County. There may need to be some conversations around, um, and I'm not saying we just ignore what we're saying here. Um, we, we have to have a robust conversation about what the options might be to either provide some support for child care providers or something else along those lines to allow for us to have both the public health benefits of staying in a reasonable phase while not, you know, losing those folks from child care. I think there's, I think we, we, we agree that that conversation will have to happen if we do not receive this waiver. I missed it. Do we say how long we expect them to take to decide whether we get the waiver or not? We don't know, unfortunately, but I think yeah. Yeah, yeah. we would, Okay. Just the time, though, certainly we would continue to push and exhaust our resources to get an answer. And, you know, I won't make a sign. Well, we, this isn't the first time where we've been waiting on state guidance and we've had to, you know, put forth some action anyway in the absence of that. I have a couple questions about fairness, um, because right or wrong, I, I appreciate what you said, Dr. Gales, about not trying to single out one industry over another, but there's that perception and we want to try to address it. Um, the folks that... Um, I've heard from quite a bit, and, you know, my district, uh, you might not follow it like we do, but, you know, borders Howard County, borders an entire border of Prince George's County, borders the District of Columbia. So I have lots of um, restaurants um, and lots of um, retail establishments where um, if people can't get what they want um, in Montgomery County, it's very easy for them to go to another jurisdiction. So I um, appreciate what you said about working with the other health officers. Um, I, I do have this question about um, – and that in what Earl said about um, by showing our leadership on public health, we're incentivizing them and we're going to encourage them to do the right thing. Have we um, taken a step back and said, look, we all need to do this. If you share our concern, why don't we pick a date certain and we all take the same actions at the same time? We did that with the minimum wage. Um, we don't want to create uh, 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 unintentionally a business advantage for these surrounding counties. Um, for their restaurants to prosper, their bars to prosper, their retail establishments to prosper at the expense of ours, because especially if our customers are leaving Montgomery County and getting COVID there and bringing it back to our county. Um, has that been proposed by the other by other health officers or the county executive to our county exec to their county executives and to the mayor? I would say from the health officer perspective, we talk regularly. I mean, and and to be honest, so we don't, I mean, for, we're, we're not making the decisions, we're providing the guidance. And so we are quite frequently or very much on the same page in terms of, you know, the guidance and our perspectives from a health, from a health perspective. You know, we also certainly recognize that there is lots of diversity in the, re, the surveillance realities of different communities, um, as well as different political realities. Uh, you know, it's been interesting even in this setting to talk about increases in cases and having conversations with the other health officers in Maryland. You know, everybody's jurisdiction is a little different. Um, and so even if our recommendations and guidance is the same, you know, who's listening to that and how they're hearing it is very different. Uh, but, you know, we continue to, you know, talk formally and informally uh, to try to, you know, we're, to be on the same page as much as possible. Uh, in terms of the guidance that we provide to the decision makers, such as the councils and the county executives. I, I've gotten you know, uh, today from other uh, other jurisdictions saying, are you all doing this because we're looking at what we're going to do? I just think if, I'm happy to say this to the county executive and not put it on you, but if he hasn't reached out, we yeah. should. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. To, be, to be clear, that they have the county executives have spoken from certainly the big six jurisdictions on on a weekly basis. Uh, the, the county executive, Elrich, has been attempting to recruit other partners in this. There's just a lot of trepidation. And I think that it's understandable, but just, um, you know, uh, we got to the point where we've been holding back on this recommendation for weeks, trying to recruit other people to jump, you know, jump off that proverbial ledger or, or move forward with this uh, together. And 
we have not been able to get partnerships on this. And at this point, you know, we feel like us taking this leap of, you know, of confidence in our public health uh, uh, leadership from Dr. Gales is, is the right thing for our residents. We, we just cannot continue to sit here while we try and foster support from other jurisdictions while our residents are becoming infected and, and potentially worse. I think that's the key point we've gotten to that point. And so we agree that this would be much better. It would be better from a public health perspective. It would be better from a, a, a support from our residents perspective if other jurisdictions were in lockstep with us. Uh, we 100% agree with that and we've attempted to get to there. And I, I don't want to announce something ahead of someone else but I do not suspect by next week we'll be alone on this issue. Just I, under, I hope that's hope that's clear. Good, uh, no. uh, yeah, that's very helpful. That'll be uh, some reassurance to some of the like restaurant owners I talked to even last night on the border of Howard County or the border of D.C. that see their customers just you know pick up and leave and and uh, and then come right back um, to to sleep in Montgomery County after spending their money elsewhere. Um, I wanted to get to these fairness questions. Um, have, do we know from the data how much of transmission is due to grocery stores or to, and also to big box retail stores like Home Depot? I would respond the same way. You know, I, uh, I can't remember who just asked the question, but, you know, I mean, it was you actually in terms of the, uh, the contact tracing data um, in terms of how it's broken down uh, in terms of specifics. So uh, I'm sure if we looked at, the, you know, broke it down to a granular level, we could say there was an investigation related to this store and that store. But the way we get that information from the state who compiles the reports, right. it's in aggregate to this setting. Well, I would, I would just say then, given that the data is dirty and that it's hard to say, okay, restaurants should, you know, suffer or uh, undergo more restrictions and big box stores do not have to or groceries do not have to. My own unscientific surveys of like the groceries that I go to in the big box stores, I see great variation. Um, you go to Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, there's a line outside the door because they're restricting the number of customers. They're making up sure everybody's masked. They're wiping down every cart every time somebody releases one uh, before they give it to a new customer. And they're very assiduous to, um, you know, follow our guidelines. And then you go to most of the giants and Safeways that I go to, and there's far more of those in the county, and they're far larger employers. Um, and they're not doing that. And some of the stores are extremely crowded. Often there's people not wearing masks um, and there's no proposed restrictions that I've seen for grocers. And I personally, I, I worry more about the time I have to spend, you know, grocery shopping than, than many other things because I can't really avoid it. Um, I've heard a lot of the same concerns about Home Depot's and Lowe's, no restrictions on the number of people in there, often people not wearing masks, um, lots of trips that are, um, uh, non-essential, but um, but no restrictions on those. And gro both the grocers and the large retail stores like Home Depot represent large, gi giant global employers that have been extremely profitable through this entire uh, pandemic. People are spending more and cooking more at home and making home improvements, um, and they uh, are not going to go out of business, and they're not going to leave Montgomery County, whereas our small independent restaurants and bowling alleys um, are family owned in many cases and um, and don't have that option. They, they are already going out of business every week. So I just think many of them have expressed, you know, we want to be on the team. We want to um, do our part, but we're being singled out at the expense of these other large institutions with that can withstand financial hardship much to a much greater degree that where they're not they're not uh, um, uh, uh, getting the same types of restriction. Do you have thoughts on that? So the restrictions that we've proposed from the, again, I can only speak from the health side, apply to all of these facilities. And if there is an entity that is violating the provisions where people aren't wearing face coverings, aren't adhering to capacity limits, aren't adhering to physical distancing, they should be reported to the health department uh, so that they can be appropriately investigated and um, cited accordingly. Um, and even in looking at the restrictions that we've offered in this setting, for, you know, to arrest the increase in cases, they apply across the board. You know, we didn't just come up, or what we've recommended, it didn't just come out and say store extra clothes. This is saying every, all of these facilities have to adhere to the capacity limits and guidelines. And so, you know, to be very clear, that is the intention from the health perspective, that it's not to single out one type of entity versus the other one. It's saying across the board, we need to tighten up and put in the restrictions. 
because in the absence of that, the cases could continue to increase. That would lead to much more restrictive action that could be taken from a local, regional, or a state perspective. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Reno. Thank you. Uh, this has been a really good discussion. Um, it's just remarkable to see how much knowledge is, uh, you know, here among everybody. Um, thank you. Most of many of my questions have been asked and, and answered uh, or responded to. Um, but I wanted to pick up where several have left off. Um, you know, a question I have is enforcement. I I feel like there is a very, you know, uh, different levels of compliance. And, and we have hotspots in the county. We have zip codes where we have more transmission. It does seem, seem to fluctuate a bit. But can't we be doing more to increase our enforcement? And I'm not necessarily saying let's get out and um, – you know, we don't have, for example, you don't get a ticket for not wearing a mask, but can't we bring on more staff to be on the ground, you know, in communities where we know we're experiencing more transmission and do a better job with, actually, it's education and enforcement and, and offering resources, you know, offering isolation, quarantine, you know, residency, uh, if, if we can make that available. Um, I, I think we have had a, a very strong vision of providing uh, targeted testing and, and public health, uh, you know, response. But can't we do more uh, to tackle this head on and hopefully have a, have a bigger impact? I think one of the realities of the across-the-board closure, you know, to the extent that we, we do that, we are closing – businesses or restricting businesses where there's very little transmission in the community, uh, the same as we are restricting them in communities where there's very high transmission. And isn't it possible for us to, you know, do more? And I, I've been saying this from the beginning, like I would be very happy to hire, you know, 50, 100, 150, 200 people to be kind of a COVID core and, and, and just be out there, you know, on the ground. And I know that we are on the ground, like we're visiting restaurants and so forth, but I've just got to believe that we could do a lot more because um, why, why shouldn't we be able to do more, right? There's it's sort of an unlimited need in a, in a sense. But um, so could I ask uh, just for a brief response from either of our doctors, uh, you know, what is your – sense here can can we would we have more uh benefit from doing a lot more outreach education enforcement or are we kind of maxing out what we can do should we be looking at that as well um, i'd be happy to start i'm sure uh, dr stoddard has quite a bit to add because i know he has overseen a large amount of the different things that you've talked about that are already actually in place um, and so I think the first principle I'd like to highlight is what's difficult to go through, if you will, with a surgical knife to do what you're recommending in terms of having, uh, you know, geographic specific closures, those kinds of things. The challenge, as many of your colleagues have laid out, is that people work, play, they shop, they go all over. The I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I wasn't actually saying let's have geographic focused closures. I had said that I had said. I had asked that we look at that in the past. I was I was moving beyond that. I was saying let's setting that aside. Geographic focus, you know, enforcement, education, and, and, and outreach. That's really what I so I wanted to be careful to draw that distinction okay. so that I could get the benefit of that response. Well, again, I, I think it, it actually is the same. I have the same response because it, it makes it challenging to uh, you know when people are coming and going. And so I may live in the zip code where 
I am kept showing up as a case, but I'm working and I'm playing and I'm doing all those other things in other areas. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. Now, from an enforcement perspective, you know, we have we have put we our pop up testing we're using now to go to those areas when they show increases. For example, we saw um, a, a sharp uptick in cases in the Rockville Twin Book air, work area over the last several weeks, and we've had a number of dedicated testing events there to capture that. And so we're trying to use that purpose there. In those testing settings, there have been, and I see Dr. Crowell on, um, there's been, we've linked testing with social support services. So we have, as part of testing, we've got people actively working to link people to those social support needs that they have in those settings. There's been the creation of the community hubs that have been stood up across the county to address a lot of the needs that you've mentioned. There's been significant, uh, you know, social support, particularly in the food security area that Dr. Stoddard has been a, a, a part of. In terms of hoteling spaces for quarantine, we do have that set up. So if families are identified or individuals are identified who need a space to go to for isolation and quarantine, we've had that program in place now since June. Um, and then actually the, the COVID core that you mentioned is something that was, was done throughout the summer, uh, utilizing in particular our younger folks to be able to provide additional services. Now, from the enforcement perspective, I want to send a special thank you to all of the staff at uh, our licensing and regulatory services team, as well as our ABS team who have been going through um, exhaustively over the weekends and at nights to go around and ensure that businesses are complying, uh, in addition to doing their regular jobs uh, to keep people safe. Now, within that, we would, you know, need to grow that certainly, but a lot of that is because there's so many businesses, there's so many entities, Unfortunately, a lot of our response is complaint driven. And so when you when people are seeing businesses not complying in certain things, we get that information and we're actively engaging it, uh, engaging in that and investigating it and moving forward. Um, and I would like to just also highlight because you all have supported these groups. Uh, we've got two initiatives being spearheaded by the Latino Health Initiative, as well as the African American Health Program, who are their purposes are to one, increase access to testing, but to do provide a lot of the services that you described in terms of being boots on the ground, connected to the communities intimately and closely to be able to address their needs. Okay. I would, I would add, so there's, I think anyone who's ever done outreach and communications would always say like, you know, more would help. But what I would, what I would be very clear about here is uh, our cases are going up in as weather has cooled. So it's, it's not that there's been some gross drop in our compliance that is driving this. I mean, sure, that is part of the issue. But the reality is that um, when we go out to businesses, so we, we do both, an, we have an education program. The Montgomery County Safety Alliance has been working on this program for both enforcement and education. We do education most days, like a you know normal going out, working with businesses, engaging with them. Been, been very receptive, get, gotten great response from the community. Uh, as well. On the enforcement side, the vast majority of the businesses that we visit aren't having violations. We've not seen an increase in the violations over time. But what we know is that the contact tracing data tells us and, and the community transmission level tells us it's everything is coming up. Everything is ratcheting up. And so in spite of their compliance with our rules for the most part, we're still seeing this increase. So I do not believe increased enforcement would would cause us to see a dramatic drop in the transmission of this virus because we're not seeing high levels of noncompliance even in the setting of increased community transmission. It's not that there, there's noncompliance or non-understanding of the rules is necessarily driving them. The rules are not perfect. And so if someone sits in a, in a restaurant and they – you know, cough and they, they pull their face you know, face covering down and move. Is that a transmission point? It, it's very likely a transmission point. Is that something that's an enforcement issue for a restaurant, an education issue for a restaurant? No, it isn't. It's, a, you know, it's sort of, a, you know, it, would it help? Yes. Would we still be discussing the same things we're discussing today if we had 200 people more doing education and enforcement? I believe we would. Okay. That's a helpful response. Um, uh, Regarding the late night order, um, I did listen to the press conference yesterday and you had said that you will suspend the 10 p.m. Uh, you know, allowance this Friday at five o'clock. Will you still suspend the 10 p.m. allowance 
my understanding is that uh, essentially that order is required to be suspended under the old iteration, and it will still be required to be suspended under the new iteration. So either way, it's required to be suspended. So will you still suspend it at, on Friday at 5 o'clock? Correct. And to my understanding, notice has already been sent to the, the permit holders of that happening tomorrow at 5 p.m. Okay. Um, final quick point on contact tracing. I'm glad we're adding this provision around the restaurants. Uh, I, I do wish we had added that, you know, many, many moons ago. Um, I, you know, we all observed D.C. taking that on uh, back in, I don't know, it was May, maybe April. Um, can't we do more with contact tracing? I mean, I think it is worth saying, because it has been, it's come out today, our contact tracing doesn't tell us where people get the virus. It only tells us what kind of activities they have been engaged in. We can infer that perhaps they got the virus from those interactions, but we actually don't know. And I, I have no idea whether we actually could know whether contact tracing anywhere is generating that level of information. But, you know, can't, can't we do more with our contact tracing? Can't we get more information out of it? Is it just staff? If we add people, can we have a much more refined understanding? Or is that, it, is, is that really not possible? Well, it is possible, and then it's not possible. It's, uh, there's some nuances to that. And so uh, contact tracing is most effective when you're in a controlled environment, if you will, where there's limited transmission, there's limited cases, uh, and it's easier to map out. So, for example, when we look at our congregate living situations in a nursing home, for example, you know who's coming in and out, and it makes it a little bit easier to track where the index case may come from. It's more challenging when it's the broad community where community transmission, again, is so broad and widespread and people are coming into contact in so many different places, particularly so going back to the early stages of the pandemic when everything was closed down. So it was like, again, I'm not speaking as existent, you know, Council Member Reamer shows up positive. You only, you, you know, with everything being closed down, it made it easier to track to say you were in these one or two places. Okay, one or two places who else was there during the time period. And it was easier to be able to say, okay, it's likely you picked it up from, you know, restaurant X because that was the only space you were in. And then you know that yeah. limited number of people there. And so now with so many different things being open and people going to so many different places, it makes it more challenging to be able to get that specific epi, uh, epi based data. But again, on the flip side, if there are, you know, controlled environments, it does make it easier to be able to do uh, provide the answer that you just talked about. Thank you. Well, I do think maybe for some specific and narrow purposes, we could do more like with child care, with sports. It might be that a deeper application of contact tracing in some a very few targeted areas can help us make a you know, better, broad decision. So. And to that end, we, you know, to be very clear, also in those specific settings where there have been sports cases, we've been able to identify and say this is who, this is the index case that may have come you, you in. You knew that. You've seen that. Right. Yeah. And, you know, to Council Albert, Councilmember Albernos' point earlier with the baseball example, you're able to say, well, you know, it was this is the index case. It's likely where they may have gotten it and received it somewhere else. And that was actually an excellent example to use is that we were able to track and say this was from a family gathering. But nonetheless, the person was positive and entered into this different space, and other people were exposed secondary to that. Now, just to continue the baseball example, uh, 25 people makes youth baseball impossible. You can't have a team, a coach, and an ump. You're out of you're out of you're out of bodies. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm the season is drawing to a close. But um, uh, it, anyway, all right. Thank you very much. Good discussion. I did want to mention as a time check that uh, it is now one o'clock. We were slated to, we were slated to come back at one thirty after a recess. So we still have three council members that want to uh, ask questions and time that they want to have. And once they are finished, what we'll do is figure at least a thirty minute recess, regardless of what time it is. Before we come back, if someone needs 45 minutes, we can figure that out at that point. But at this point, we still have three council members that want to speak. Council Member Glaze. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, 
very thorough and, you know, really smart and important comments by, by all of my colleagues and associate myself with their thoughts and concerns, particularly, and especially those who asked about childcare and uh, the regulations about that. Um, but there is something that I, I that, that continues to intrigue me. And it was a question by council member Al Bernaz and picked up on um, by, by council member Hucker as well. And it, and it was about the, the regional approach. And Dr. Uh, Stoddart um, tipped his hat or tipped someone else's hat a little bit, a, a slight tip by saying that by next week, we probably wouldn't be alone. Um, he suggested, and I'm not gonna ask for the bulging of, of other people's politics uh, in their jurisdictions, but the question I have is um, about this regional approach. Have we been asking for a regional approach saying this is what we wanna do and we would like you to do it along with That's us? If we haven't done that, why not? So yeah. we've we've been doing that Infinitely. And, and then, you know, to be perfectly honest, we had these conversations amongst all of us a couple of weeks ago and we talked about it and we've continued to talk about it. And in the meantime, we've been reaching out, talking for our regional partners. And when I say we, as from a health officer perspective to uh, Dr. Stoddard reaching out to his colleagues and peers in emergency management, uh, Rich Madalino reaching out to several other CAOs and County Executive Elrich reaching out to other County Executives to engage in the conversations. Um, and, you know, even as last week, early last week, when we saw, you know, we had a couple of cases, uh, I think over the two weekends ago, where it was 160 some cases, 150 cases, you know, sounding the alarm and saying, hey, we got to move, we got to do something. And so we've been really working hard to get a regional approach and response, but then also really also working to get a state level response as well. And that's something that I think it's important to talk about is right now we don't have, you know, state guidelines to say we have a reopening plan, but we don't have any guidelines to talk about, well, what are the markers that we hit that we need to go back? And so in the absence of that, the local jurisdictions have been trying to come up with different strategies to address our immediate needs, but also working across those boundaries to do so. So I, I can't emphasize enough that yes, <laughs> lots of phone calls, lots of emails, lots of teams meetings to try to get you know folks to move together. I would also add, I think we're gonna hear from the governor today. And I think what the governor is likely to say, and I don't wanna, I won't, I won't ascribe what I think he, well, I think what we've heard he's going to say is, I'll, I'll refer to this, is he's going to talk a lot about personal responsibility, meaning it is the responsibility of individuals to protect themselves, essentially, uh, which in, in most settings is a, is a reasonable sort of way to go. But when your decisions directly affect those around you who don't get the choice to participate in an activity, it, it, you know, that's where we, we, we strongly disagree with the stance um, that we've heard the government governor may intend to take today. We're, I mean, I'm absolutely hopeful that he comes out and gives uh, a speech very akin to what he said as we were beginning to see this in February and March. I just don't think any of us expect him to do that given um, what we've been told by his perspective, um, you know, within public health, within emergency management and elsewhere. Um, but. Um, I think it's just very clear that um, this is, you know, because this is an issue where an individual's decision can affect tens or hundreds of other people by spreading a disease that, you know, um, this is, there is a level of personal responsibility that's deeply involved in this, but there's also a responsibility to protect the public health, not just the individual's health. And I think that we're trying to strike that balance and we're really pushing our state counterparts, our local counterparts, our regional counterparts to participate in this with us. And again, I think we would be, we would have made these recommendations, we have been making these recommendations for a couple of weeks. And it was only because we could not recruit some other regional partners that we're doing this individually absent that support. Uh, and so I just want to be clear about what we've been attempting to, we would like to be, this to be a coalition. It would be better for public health, it would be better for all of us who are coalition. And we're hopeful that other jurisdictions are going to be adding on shortly, but we, we just got to the point where we just didn't feel comfortable waiting until that were to happen. 
Well, we will see what the governor says, uh, but from my vantage point, when people of a certain political persuasion discuss personal responsibility, to me, that's an abdication of leadership, quite frankly. Uh, and so we, we will see what he says. Um, but with, I, I, I do want to come back, Dr. Stoddart, to the, the regional approach. And if we know now or expect that another jurisdiction is going to take the same actions that we have, how long have we known that and why not come out with that joint statement or proclamation? And, and that gets back to this communication issue. And I have another thought after we, we discuss this particular regional approach, but it all comes down to communication. And if we can show some unity within the region, I think that betters, uh, is for the betterment of everybody. Yeah, so I think that every jurisdiction is slightly different. So I think what you're going to see is like 80, 85 percent overlap with what we're suggesting be done. And, and then each jurisdiction will have their own, you know, you know, for example, we don't have casinos. Other neighboring jurisdictions around us have casinos and they have to make a little bit different rules for their. So there will not be a 100 percent like where we say this is the thing we're doing and everyone's doing this thing. Uh, there are also other jurisdictions that have their metrics are a bit different than ours, where they're seeing their distribution of cases or perhaps where they're. Uh, where they may already have had different rules before and don't need to change. For example, Anne Arundel County, I think, closes their uh, re restaurants at 11 o'clock already. And so they didn't have to do some of the things that we're talking about doing. So um, we've known, I don't want to, how to phrase this, we've been talking to a couple specific jurisdictions and believe at least one of them will be acting in the near, very near future. Um, since about Monday, but I think our moving forward to actually put, I say pen to paper, that's not actually what it was, like to actually type out an executive order has made it more real for our neighboring jurisdictions and, and that it has caused them to accelerate their processes. And so it's sort of like, you know, if we had not, if we had waited around for them to come to us and say, let's do it, would it have happened along the same time frames? I don't know, but I think our actions to actually go it alone have encouraged people to say, uh, we don't want to be the one who didn't do it at the same time. We also don't want to be the one who jumped, jumped into it first. I understand that that's another way that leadership works as well. Uh, somebody has to go first, uh, but clearly there's a lot of confusion and, and frankly, some apprehension. And so I think doing it as a region, doing it with other, other jurisdictions would, would be more helpful. And clearly the point that you made about local considerations, sure. Uh, there are unique circumstances and facilities in, in each of our jurisdictions, but uh, overall, we all have restaurants, we all have retail, and those capacity issues are probably across the board. Um, so let me just pivot to the other comment that, that I have, uh, which I've already previewed, and, and it's the communication issue. You know, I, as my colleagues have, have been talking with you all, I've been looking at the dashboard, and it says the, my, my interpretation of the dashboard. The seven day average of positive cases, you know, the rate is rising and appears to be by my eyes uh, around the same rate that we had at the end of April. And the trend line is clear, um, but at the same time, the 14 day average of positive test cases remains low. And clearly that is thanks to, you know, our efforts to, re to require or mandate face coverings when in certain areas. And when it comes to the healthcare facilities, the percentage of hospital inpatient beds that are occupied with COVID patients is on the rise and it is approaching a high level, the data says. Um, and so as these numbers continue to change and the trend lines are clear, um, we need to be sharing this information as broadly and as often as possible. And, you know, I'll, for those who are following this conversation, you can see this information right now, montgomerycountymd.gov slash COVID-19 slash data. And all of the, the concerns and questions that we, my colleagues and I, and I know all of you um, in the executive branch have received as well, is really uh, many, uh, much of it is relaying information that exists. Um, doubts that people have or just not being able to find some of the information. And so I would strongly encourage that we change some of our communication practices 
um, so that we do more frequent emails that are very simple to read with these graphics embedded in them so that people, uh, our residents, will see it for themselves. And when you see these trend lines, the data don't lie. Um, and that is my guiding light through these conversations uh, with all of you and in the decisions that we will have to make because unfortunately, this is an, an accordion effect. Uh, you know, we've t we tightened restrictions earlier this year, we're loosening restrictions, and now we're discussing tightening them again, uh, which, which isn't, it's head spinning and it's not easy for people. Um, and these are tough decisions, but when we share the data, um, I think it makes it more palatable and understandable for everybody. So happy to work with you all and uh, other folks in the PIO team to make sure that all of us um, can continue doing our job. Um, and at the front of that is educating people about the situation in our own community. Uh, and uh, uh, despite some, some texts I've been receiving, I'm not going to press you, Dr. Stoddard, to reveal the other jurisdictions uh, that, that we'll be sharing uh, some news later in this week, probably going against all of my former journalistic training, but uh, I will refrain uh, and I'll await that news by the other jurisdictions. So thank you all for this update. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you very much. Thank you for this conversation. I um, also can say that a lot of my questions have been answered, um, but I wanted to just be on record. Um, I The way I come at this in this particular moment in time is that our cases are rising. We're very concerned from the start of this pandemic. It's not as if we have received federal guidance that we could, you know, follow specifically in the state. Uh, also, uh, has not been necessarily completely forthcoming in terms of what a jurisdiction like ours has had to face. So we've had to make decisions early on uh, to protect the health and safety of our residents. And unfortunately, here we are again. We've been talking about this for a while that there will be. Uh, because what the data has been showing nationally and also locally that we could expect a rise in cases, unfortunately compounding with the flu season in the winter. And so here we find ourselves um, having to, again, figure out how to manage um, this moving target. Uh, and so I want to be on record saying that for me, the health and safety of our residents is paramount. Um, I can also say that we can look at our track record that, you know, when we had to make decisions that were not easy ones without a lot of guidance, we were able to fare a lot better than other jurisdictions around the country who took a different approach. And that is important because that means lives, but it also means an effect on our economy. So I know this is very hard. Um, I appreciate the feedback that all my colleagues have shared because I agree with that. Um, and to the extent I saw that, you know, PIO, it's, it's, it's here listening to the extent that uh, our PIO offices can get together to re, you know, reframe, if you will, um, and also enhance the communication strategy to match this particular point in time. I think that would be super, super important. Kudos to all of the people who have been working so hard in the communities, the initiatives were mentioned, and my gosh, I can't help but always notice on social media all the very, very strong grassroots work that's taking place in these communities. This is a template, you know, we can expand on that if we have to, um, but to me, the number one issue here is that as difficult as it is for all of us, you know, and as a mom, I feel this very deeply, um, but my first instinct is to protect my, my children, and by extension, honor the responsibility as an elected official here in Montgomery County to first prioritize the health and safety of our residents. We have to do that. Uh, so glad to know that um, the feedback has been heard in terms of this executive order um, and what we need to do regarding the child care piece. But I think it boils down to this piece of uh, communication, as Councilor McGlass said, making it as digestible as possible for people. Um, many will not necessarily agree, but I can tell you that I 
know that many, many more will if they're able to understand exactly what we're doing, uh, why we're doing what we have to do. Um, so I don't have questions because everybody's already asked them, but I just want to be on record saying, um, you know, this is not easy for any of us, uh, but we are here. We have to address it. Uh, and, you know, you have my support to continue to prioritize the health and safety of our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I just want to, um, you know, I went quickly to try and make sure I was within the five minute window. I wasn't apprised of the fact that we didn't have a limitation. So I just want to follow up on a couple very quick things. 26,777 people as of the last report who had been affected by COVID. I have asked the question numerous times of Dr. Gales as to what the other effects of folks who have come down with COVID is uh, in terms of heart conditions, lung capacity issues, all kinds of long-term effects that we still don't know um, are affecting. So I want us to look beyond the deaths um, and say that, look, we also need to be concerned about the long-term effects of what this virus is wreaking on people's bodies that we just don't know yet. So that's why this is even greater than just the deaths. But let me just be very clear. Look, again, born and raised here in Montgomery County, our, mur our murder rate, right, is very low here in Montgomery County. We have 841 people who have died since April. 841 Montgomery County residents that have died and another 41 that most likely have died from COVID. This is far beyond any gang issue, any other kind of issue that we would be up in arms and saying, we need to do something. We need to shut stuff down. We need to make sure that we're bringing in the National Guard. All kinds of things would be our reaction. What concerns me, and it pains me to say this, but what concerns me is, is that primarily this is affecting people of color and people of lower socioeconomic status. And it feels to me as though we are looking past that and somehow making it seem as though, well, it's not affecting me. It's not affecting my neighborhood. I don't see it with my folks. And so therefore it's okay. And we can just go on about our daily lives. I signed up for this job to make sure that the most vulnerable would be protected. I signed up for this job and I ran for this office to make sure that those were, that were marginalized, those that were left in the shadows would, be, would have the light shown upon them and be lifted up. That's what our opportunity is by doing this. I understand that some people who just don't see it don't understand why it is that we're doing what we're doing. But let me tell you, as an elected official, I see it. I see it in our community. I see it in our communities of color. I see the devastation for those families that are sad, that can't even attend the funeral of someone that they love. It is real. And we've got to do something about it because it's getting worse. It's not getting better. All of us are being touched by this. You've heard it. And so I know my colleagues feel the same way. I know it's hard for us to make decisions like this. I have a wife who has a business and I already said to someone, look, who was questioning me. I said, look, if we say we need to shut down salons, shut down the damn salons. Because guess what? If it means that my wife and my family's life is protected and the clients that she serves are protected, so be it. That should be tantamount. And so Dr. Gales, I just wanna to say to you, thank you, sir. From the very beginning, we have listened to you and said that we would adhere to what it was that you gave us in terms of guidance. You are the one who told us, along with other health experts, but you told us, we can go back to the tape. You said in the fall, we would see a spike. Well, here it is. You've been on point. So anybody who questions you in terms of uh, what, it, what it is that you're giving us in terms of guidance, just go back and watch the videos. Go back and watch what our health experts have said and warned us about that was coming. They've been right all along. And so why we would step away and not listen to them now because it's hard or because it's difficult or because, well, some people may not like it or they're tired of hearing us shutting down stuff and closing stuff down. Well, guess what? I'm tired of seeing people die from COVID. I'm tired of seeing people of color 
who are afflicted at much greater rates of COVID. That's what I'm tired of. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to be very brief, and but because so much has been said, and, and I agree with so much with what has been said. But obviously, we needed to have this discussion. Uh, it, it was it was something that we needed to do. Uh, we're doing it on a day that we're we're busy with other other items, but I don't know that other items are really as as life uh, changing as this item that we're discussing today, right now. And candidly, I've heard from constituents that said uh, we need to wait to do what we're doing, and I've heard from constituents that said you shouldn't wait. You know, the longer you wait, you're you're hurting people. And you should, we should vote even today, which we're not going to do, but, but I've heard that. But I, I also have, have heard from some who said that if you would have done this in the beginning, if you would have shut everything down in the beginning for two weeks, we wouldn't be here today. I don't know that that's correct, but everybody seems to have an opinion. But the reality is that we need to make certain that people are safe. And that's what we're discussing today. So I, I do believe that, that, um, that on Tuesday we will have this vote. I do believe that, that hopefully Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard will go back and, and uh, at one point they used to say sharpen your pencil. I don't know that anybody uses those anymore, but if you'll sharpen your pencil and make certain that what we're saying is clear and concise and is truly going to be understood why we're doing what we're doing. And I also think when it comes to the, the child care, I, I, it concerns me that some child care uh, providers might have to, to um, tell a family that they're no longer going to be allowed to, to have their child come to that, to that facility. That bothers me, and I know it bothers everyone else as well. If there is a way that there could be some process that we could help uh, the child care providers hire additional people, that we can look at our at our um, and and our the way the, that that our funding is working. If there's additional monies that we could help someone uh, using CARES Act or, or whatever funds, so that they could use some of that money to hire additional help perhaps that would be him in assistance as well. And that would be if, if the state does not give us the waiver. Hopefully the state will give us the waiver, but, but my concern is what happens if the state doesn't. So I think we need to continue to work together. We need to figure out how to keep each other safe and work together to keep each other safe. But I do appreciate, and others have mentioned Dr. Gales, I say it privately and publicly, and Dr. Stoddard as well. And, 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 uh, and, and Dr. Crowell as well. Uh, we appreciate everything that you do. I know you don't get the thanks you deserve, but that doesn't mean you don't deserve it. So thank you very much. And we will, we will vote on this on Tuesday. Please, please look at the order and see if there's any changes that could and should occur. Based on that, Mr. I, President, just Mr. President, yes, please. Point of clarification. Yes, go ahead. We're not, we're, I just want to clarify what we heard earlier. We're not voting on this order. We're going to be voting on an amended. Right. Or, we will be we have, voting on something on Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have timing of when we and the public should expect that order to be published so that we and they could ensure that it reflects some of the items that have been discussed today and we've heard otherwise? Uh, I haven't gotten a text from uh, Ms. Kinch uh, on that issue, but my guess is we'd have it to you tomorrow by close of business to give the weekend, but let me verify that. But I think that I'm, I'm comfortable committing to that. And, and just so we all understand, Earl, I know you don't have a close of business. The close of business is 5 p.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah and your, your business of... continues. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. <laughs> um, uh, Councilmember yes. Friedson, I'm working on it right now. Um, I should be circulating it to um, internally and hopefully we will get it to you um, early, next, early tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, is that all clear? Okay, so just so the council is aware, it is now 124. How about we say we're gonna go Mr. on- Mr. President, you, we still need to introduce oh, okay. the, we the resolutions. Okay. I appreciate that. But um, 
Well, how about if we say that we're, when we go on recess, let me restate that. When we go on recess, we'll come back at two o'clock so that we'll start the subdivision staging policy discussion at two o'clock. And with that, we have introduced, let me do it again, but the introduction of the Board of Health Regulation to adopt an executive order 122-20 COVID-19 local order amending and restating order dated September 29th, 2020. That has now been introduced. Let me ask, if we are changing that, would that order change a number? Would it be the same number? Does anybody know? Why do we need to introduce it if we're not? Well, you're introducing the resolution and the resolution obviously is going to get amended to change the effective date of the order. And the order itself is going to get amended. But I just- Why wouldn't we wait to introduce the resolution that accurately reflects the exact verbiage of the order? I mean, that doesn't seem, I think we're putting the cart before the horse here. Well, then you're leaving yourself- Okay. Go ahead. You can do it then. You've been interrupted. Go ahead. You're leaving yourself then once again, introducing and acting on the same day when you have a chance to introduce it now and act on Tuesday and the actual resolution would be amended on Tuesday. But just really for the effective date and if the executive order changes, the number changes, the executive order is going to be substantively amended. You won't be introducing, you won't be adopting this executive order. You know, I suppose you could do it either way. I was just trying to avoid having to introduce and adopt on the same day. It's just like any other resolution. You introduce it one day, the following week, you may amend it, but then you act on it the following week. That's all I was trying to do. But in this case, that's what we were going to do today. Yeah. I mean, you could, you can introduce it and act on it on the same day because, you know, by declaring it's an emergency, clearly it is. But I think the greater risk is by if tomorrow afternoon, there's a new executive order and the resolution that's posted is different from the executive order. And there's confusion among county residents and businesses and families of which item they're supposed to look like. I think we'd be causing more problems than we're solving. Yeah, I agree with you, Council Member. I think that we'd be better off not to introduce this now. We had a public discussion. We had a public hearing, but it was really a public discussion on people's concerns. We've heard them loud and clear. We've explained many of them and gotten clarification on many. But I think at this point, if it's, Mr. Drummer, if you don't have a heart attack. Well, if you're going to introduce a brand new resolution on Tuesday, then you need to hold a public hearing on it. You've already held a public hearing on this resolution, and now you're going to act on it Tuesday. That's why I think you want to introduce it. Yeah, we'll have to have another public hearing. Yeah, we'll have to have another public hearing if we introduce another one. So, I mean, we could do that, but I think it has to be clear that we cannot change it and then pretend that the public hearing we had today is the public hearing for that one. If we go that route, we're going to have to have a public hearing. Yeah, I agree. But I agree totally with that. But I also think we should be having another public hearing because we're making substantive changes. I totally agree with Council Member Navarro. But I think that's all the reason why we should introduce it cleanly, let people speak to what is actually being discussed. Okay, so we will not be introducing this. We will, on Tuesday, we'll be having another public hearing on what is, hopefully, we will receive this by tomorrow, no later than tomorrow, and at five o'clock tomorrow. So, at this point, we are going to be in recess. We are coming back at two o'clock to have the conversation about the subdivision staging policy. Thank you very much. See everybody in 30 minutes. Thanks. Thank you.